episode of Byzantium and Friends. I'm Anthony, your host. I'm assuming that most of you are broadly familiar with the problems of studying the historical Jesus. Uh, This is the uh, English uh, version of the Latin version of the Greek version of the Hebrew name that we otherwise call Joshua. This one being the founder of the Christian religion. The texts about him are a little bit later, probably not written by eyewitnesses. They're written in a language that he probably didn't use. We, we, we don't know how much Greek Jesus would have known or been exposed to, but uh, probably most of his ministry was not carried out in Greek. It's difficult to assess the reliability of the various traditions, their priority and order, and the way in which they evolved from possibly oral traditions or earlier texts and so forth. External sources, that is non-Christian sources about early Christianity, are also a little bit late um, and elusive. They don't always give us the information that we want. Uh, And so it's a difficult historical question and one to which a fairly significant scholarly industry uh, is devoted and has been for a very long time. The problem of the historical Jesus is a somewhat separate problem from the issues of sort of theology and biblical hermeneutics, though they're all tangled up together in various ways. You can't access the historical core unless you understand the theological filter through which it's been processed in the text that we have, and vice versa. Now, when we look sideways to the life of the Prophet Muhammad, the founder of the religion of Islam, there's a similar set of problems. The narrative and biographical texts about his life and career are also much later. The chain of transmission is very difficult to reconstruct. We can't get from the earliest reconstructions of the that chain to you know within his lifetime. That it's a it's a bit of, there's a bit of a stretch there, and there are all kinds of political developments that intervened between his lifetime and the writing of those texts pretty massive developments. However, there are some striking differences. And one of them is the existence of the Quran, which is a text in the language uh, in which Muhammad operated and one which he was very, very likely responsible for, pretty much in the version that we have it in. Now, that text, however, is not rich in narrative and biographical information. That's not its point. And so it's a very, very different and difficult process to try to reconstruct history uh, from it. Um, it involves a great deal of the sort of philological and historical work on the meaning of words and the evolution of their usage within the text, uh, You know, assuming we can reconstruct the order in which it was composed. There's also another problem, which is that the origins of Islam compound uh, what those who are more familiar with Christian history would be the problems of like the historical Jesus with the problems of, let's say, Constantine and his decision to make Christianity the or a official religion of the Roman Empire. In the case of Islam, the creation of the religion and the creation of the empire in which it was the dominant or favored religion were more or less the same event. Um, They happen very, very closely together so that they, in a sense, constitute the same historical problem. And those of you who are familiar with the problems of the reign of Constantine will know that, you know, his decision is difficult to explain. Uh, I mean, we know the rough outlines of what he did and what he said, but the conception as to what exactly he thought he was building and Um, remains obscure. Um, And the same is true about the creation of the caliphate or the, um, you know, the Arab conquest or the Muslim conquest, however you want to understand them. The events are not very well documented and the sort of intentions and motivations and goals of the people involved are very, very obscure and likewise subject to a great deal of, uh, you know, variety and interpretation. So the Christian scripture is very narrative focused, which is great for historians, but it is later and not written in the language of the founder himself, whereas 
the sacred text of Islam is in Arabic, is linked to the Prophet, but has very little narrative. Uh, if, if you read the Quran, you realize just how different a kind of text it is. My guest today is Sean Anthony, a colleague of mine at Ohio State. Now, he is an expert on early Islam and the Quran and so forth, um, though he has in the past written about uh, Sasanian Persia and also Byzantine matters or you know Byzantine adjacent matters, such as, for example, uh, he is the person who has finally sorted out all of the problems relating to the family and background of John of Damascus, uh, one of the most important these sort of Byzantine, I mean, not not operating within the, the East Roman polity, but a very important figure for Byzantine thought and orthodoxy. Today we're going to be talking about Sean's most recent book, came out last year, and it's called Muhammad and the Empires of Faith. This is a remarkable book uh, in many ways, and one of the very few academic monographs on a topic that, you know, I've read a fair amount about, that I was just drawn into and it became a kind of page turner for me. So I wanted briefly to mention some of its virtues. The first is that it is a brave book, and I mean that specifically in a methodological sense. It is not content to merely you know, excavate the images or representations or receptions of the life of Muhammad in later texts, which is hard enough to do on its own, uh, but in this case, Sean is actually committed to the project of trying to work through all of our sources, which are later and, and also involve you know, both Arabic Muslim sources and uh, Christian sources, and some of them being quite early, in fact, earlier than some of the Muslim sources, barring the Quran. He's committed to the project of working through this body of material to, to work back toward what we can, as historians, and, you know, obviously with all of the doubts and skepticism that historians should have, a call the historical Muhammad. So there are no cop-outs here like, oh, I'm just working on the reception, I'm just working on the tradition, I'm just studying this source. Secondly, it is a very clear, clearly written book. Uh, the argument is laid out uh, with great lucidity and even though, yes, there are pages, especially in the middle, that get pretty technical and you have uh, full of like Arabic names with lots of little squiggly marks and you know, the, uh, uh, unraveling the transmission of information um, in some of the Muslim traditions, you know, gets pretty esoteric. Nevertheless, uh, Sean has done a remarkable job uh, in presenting all of the strands of the different traditions so it's very clearly. So even a non-expert can follow the arguments uh, pretty well. And third, the book is one of the most compelling efforts that I've seen to integrate the methodologies for the study of late antique and Byzantine literature to the tradition of Islamic texts and biographical narratives in particular. So for some time now, there's been uh, a, let's say, programmatic effort to study early Islam as part of the broader orbit of the late antique world, though for the most part that tends to mean, you know, using large-scale interpretive categories such as empire, universal empire, or apocalypticism, or sacred text, you know, generally concepts that, uh, you know, operate on a rather stratospheric level. Sean does this on a more granular level, like getting into the nitty-gritty of textual narratives and templates, and he does a fantastic job, especially toward the end of the book, of showing how a certain Byzantine hagiographical motifs uh, lie actually uh, you know, at the, the matrix of certain traditions that were told in Muslim sources later on uh, about the Prophet. And also in the first part of the book, he, he uh, has one of the most interesting discussions of the uh, early sort of crit Christian witnesses to the rise of Islam um, and a uh, very interesting interpretation of, of those texts and what they're saying uh, in the 7th century, so right, right as events are happening in some cases. Anyway, I'll stop talking. Uh, thanks to Medievalist.net for reposting these episodes on their website. And so without any further delay, here's my conversation with Sean Anthony. Hello, Sean. Welcome to the podcast. 
Hi, Anthony. Thanks for having me on. So let's dive right into it. I expect that most of the listeners of this podcast will be more familiar with the problem of the historical Jesus. So that the white whale of, of there's a whole cottage industry devoted to just that problem. And they're probably familiar with Q and the question of the authorship of the gospels and the non-scriptural sources like Tacitus and Josephus and what their value and weight is and so on. And, you know, just the basic reconstruction revolves around those kinds of problems. So if we turn to the life of the prophet Muhammad, broadly speaking, what are the difficulties that historians face in reconstructing that? And so what are the main categories of sources? Because, you know, you, you get the impression from some scholars that we really ultimately know nothing and then from other books, one reads like almost a diary of what he did every day. And, you yeah. know, he got up and he walked the dog and he spoke with soever and he said this and that. And, and I, so we're anyway. So a lot of people might be confused between the abundance of material and the skepticism that some people have. And I think your book is mm -hmm. trying to bring some clarity to those kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. But what is the, the broad shape of the problem? What's it look like? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll start with the first one. When we compare, for example, the problem of the historical Jesus with uh, the problem of the historical Muhammad, at least as, as it's been understood, I think, by some scholars working more in the Western tradition, even though that distinction is, I think, becoming increasingly less relevant. Um, so if we think about Jesus, we have a small body of sayings that may or may not be attributed to him. They're not recorded in his language. They're recorded in Koine Greek, so we don't have the Aramaic version, except for maybe scattered things here and there. And we have these gospels that tell his life story. We're not really sure who wrote them. Uh, we have attributions that we can either accept or leave from the from the tradition and so on and so forth. Uh, however, so what we know about him through those sources is very limited. However, we have a more or less decent understanding as historians and archaeologists of his historical context. So we know a decent amount about first century Roman Palestine, whether it comes from historical sources like Josephus or recent archaeological work. Um, but the person of Jesus himself is a little bit of a mystery, and we don't really have a lot of sayings and teachings that are either in his language that are this voluminous corpus. Actually, it's really quite small. You could probably read through them all in, like, say, 30 minutes. Mm. Um, in contrast, that with the historical Muhammad, we have this massive saying source, which we call the Quran. It's not recorded in Greek or Syriac or any other dialect of Aramaic, but it's actually recorded in what we consider to be his, his first language, Arabic. And it's, I say it's massive, but to give you kind of comparative size, it's equivalent to the size of the New Testament. So imagine if you have a New Testament, but in front of you, Instead of having a few kind of red letter words, you know, the red letter words that are true to Jesus, right. the whole thing is red, right? <laughs> yeah. From yes. like, from, you know, the gospel of Matthew to Revelation, it's all red, right? It's the and red so, letter edition. <laughs> yeah, it's all red letter. And so from that perspective, it's like, wow, what an amazing source. And in many ways, this is the first source that we have. Okay. So this is the, for any Arabic language, we have some inscriptions. We have pre-Islamic poetry that survives from a later date. Uh, it has its own questions of authenticity too. Uh, but you know, this is kind of ground zero for the birth of Arabic literature. And so it's a very important source. Uh, but the thing is, it's, it's very difficult to interpret. Uh, the analogy that I try to give to people is imagine trying to reconstruct, um, I don't know, the history of the Israelites based upon the book of Psalms only. Right. And so we have this very early document. We'll probably talk early, uh, later about why we think it's, it's early. Uh, and then we have uh, this tradition that kind of tells us how to read it. Okay. But this tradition comes from uh, centuries later, depending on who you ask. Uh, it either is written by kind of a grandson of the first generation of Muslims, or it's written by a grandson of, uh, of a great-great-grandson of, of the first generation of Muslims. And, you know, a lot of history separates the writing down, the codification, the redaction of those stories about the life of Muhammad and the earliest kind of enunciation of the Quran itself. Uh, we're talking about at least three uh, regime chains of, of massive uh, uh, 
political importance in terms of lethal dynasties, that is the rulers of the early Islamic polity. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a spread of the inhabitants of the Arabian Peninsula, mostly the tribesmen out of the Arabian Peninsula itself, which is itself is very large. It's about the size of India, but they spread outside of that. They go to Mesopotamia, they go to the Iranian Plateau, they go to the Nile Valley, they go to North Africa, right? So this huge spread of the original um, uh, believers from Arabia and things like that. And, you know, all of the massive cultural transformations that happens when it comes to the influx of the local populations who they called, who they conquered into the religion as well. So, I mean, you, we could be here all day and list all the different things that uh, happened be, you know, between the time in which uh, Muhammad ostensibly first enunciated the Quran and when we get the stories about his life being written down. And to add to that, uh, like I said, with Jesus, we know a good deal about uh, first century Roman Palestine, Second Temple Judaism, not as much as we would like, but a decent amount. Yeah. Uh, we know nothing about the Arabia of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, virtually, especially about Mecca. We know more about some of the territory around him if we go down to the Yemen, we go further north uh, to the, the territories that used to belong to the Nabataean Kingdom and stuff like that. But we know nothing about Mecca. Mecca doesn't appear on any historical record before the life of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and right now, there's a lot of debates over what the pe what the people uh, who lived there believed, what their religious practices were. Uh, all of this stuff is sort of still up in the air, and we're kind of still struggling to to kind of answer this question: What is the the original Arabian context of the Quran? Yeah, the gap between the Quran and those first written sources is both it's a fairly long one. But it is exactly as you say, the events that transpired in between mm -hmm. are some of the most sort of world changing events in that part of the world, mm -hmm. you know, in the millennium around them, right? Like, mm -hmm. like it's uh, tremendous upheavals. Yeah. And even within the um, Arabic Muslim tradition, you've had these dynastic changes and all kinds of wars and competing ideas uh, about, you know, who gets to speak for the movement and what does it mean and all of that that are also in between right those mm. two so uh yeah it's a it's a much um bigger filter in a way than than you have between you know jesus and the early christian literature um though it, because exactly it's interesting that you would say that that the quran comes first and all the rest is is much much later uh if you arrange the books of the new testament in the chronological order in which they were written it's the some of the epistles of paul that are yeah. first yeah um, and yeah. if you read it that way through that kind of filter, it, look, it looks very different. But anyway, let's get back to um, the uh, the Muslim material. And so let's talk a little bit about the Quran and what kind of text it is. I think that many Christians, if they haven't read it, sort of misunderstand it to yeah. be something like a Muslim version of the New Testament. Yeah. But it, it's not. As you said, it's much closer yeah. to the Psalms. Um, so does it contain historical information that you, we can use or that you used? And what do we know about the Quran as a text today that perhaps wasn't clear or that we didn't know even a generation ago? Yeah, the, the Quran definitely has kind of a vision of history, a vision of kind of the, the broad sweep of human history. That would begin with like, you know, primordial time, the creation of humanity, and then eventually this vision of the moral arc of history that culminates in the Day of Judgment when the, the wicked will be punished forever with hell and the righteous will be rewarded with you know the the eternal delights and felicities of, of paradise um but at the same time it doesn't contain a lot of stories about say its own historical context that are explicit it doesn't say and then you know the prophet muhammad walked into this town he began preaching as such right? mm -hmm. uh, what it does contain however is a lot of preaching directed towards various audiences and even this is to me what this is one of the more curious and, and fascinating aspects of the Quran. It even uh, contains kind of a record, or at least its own version of the record, the response of that audience. So the Quran is divided into uh, 114 chapters called surahs of varying lengths. Some of them are really quite long. Some of them are very short, short enough that you could easily write them on like the back of a business card or something like that. Um, and these surahs 
are essentially divided between two main time periods, the time period in which the Prophet Muhammad uh, was uh, politically weak. Uh, he was among his own people, and he's ostensibly addressing his message of monotheistic preaching to um, what the Quran calls mushrikun. It's a difficult word to translate into English, but sometimes we say pagan or polytheist. What it really means are people that worship things and pray to things other than God. So they pray, they pray to God as the creator, but they also pray to say like an angel or a goddess or something like that mm. as well. And so the Quran will preach against this, and then we'll get the responses of uh, the pagans recorded in the Quran. All right. So, for example, the Quran will say, you know, make sure that you obey God's commands because you'll be resurrected and, and judged on the day of judgment. And they'll say, no, we won't. You know, this we live, we die, and then nothing else happens after that. Only time controls our fate. You know, they don't believe in the afterlife. Okay? Epicureans. Yeah. And one of the things that's also interesting is some of the early Meccan surahs contain preaching that contains stories of uh, Mary and Jesus. Right. And so we have some passages in the Quran where the pagans say, oh, you're going to you're talking about Mary and Jesus again. Do you think this guy is better than our ancestors or our forefathers? So it kind of mocks the messenger of the Quran, bringing up Jesus and preaching about Jesus to these figures. Then you have another period in the Quran where the prophet Muhammad is essentially he is a ruler so you get more laws and he's also ruling a relatively diverse body of people he's ruling the meccans that came with him to this place called yathrib which changed his name to maybe later on he's preaching to the local arabs of, of yathrib or medina and he's also preaching to the uh jewish tribes that live on the outskirts of the city and own a number of the more fertile kind of wealthy agricultural lands and so there you get these very interesting polemics between uh, the prophet, his early preaching, and the Jews, who he is now encountering, it seems, face to face for the first time. Uh, so the Quran contains uh, a lot of historical information, but I think when historians read it and when uh, literary scholars kind of put their analysis to the text, you have to be a little bit creative with how, with how you kind of squeeze the juice out of the text, right? So how do you distill what's going on from that text? And the temptation, uh, I think, in the past has been to say, like, oh, this is a very difficult uh, passage to interpret, or who's this story addressed to? is to look to kind of the tradition that was written 200 years later and says, oh, well, this is refers to this, you know, and just mm. to kind of accept that, to codify, codify that and ratify it with kind of our, our modern kind of historical discourse and say, okay, that's what it was and then move on. And when it comes uh, to that type of material, it's very voluminous. I think one of the ways in which uh, modern scholars of a traditionalist bent and to find the skepticism of some historians like myself and even more radical skeptics kind of frustrating is they undertook, I think mostly in the course of, of the ninth century, this huge kind of sifting process where they looked at uh, the traditions about the prophet Muhammad's life, the exegetical traditions about what the Quran meant. And they sifted through it based upon their own criteria. It was a massive philological enterprise. It was extremely sophisticated as well. And even I think even by modern standards, I think some of these scholars that work in the ninth century were uh, far more sophisticated than, than some of my own colleagues, to be honest. <laughs> uh, but they, they go through and they make the sifting process and they, they pick out what they think is the, the creme de la creme, right? This is the best material, this is the oldest material. And that is the vision, the vision and the version of the Prophet Muhammad that you have. And that's the one that tends to be taken over by Sunnism. The Shiites do something else, which is as another story. And I think a lot of times the, the modern reception of uh, kind of the more minimalist view of the Prophet Muhammad using kind of the more modern historical methods is, is why are you guys so skeptical about this material? We've already looked through it, we've already uh, sifted through and found the most authentic material. And look, we have all this stuff. Now, we don't only know a lot about Mecca and in the Arabian context, we know how he dressed. We know what his favorite food was. We know the name of his camel, right? We know what mm. shoe he put on first. And so is this idea that you know the most minute details about the prophet Muhammad, how he laughed and, and everything. It's, uh, and so why have this kind of minimalist view using 
what we consider to be our earliest sources. I want to pick up on something that you said just as a digression when you said that the Quran contains within it the voice of the audiences that Muhammad is addressing and they're mm -hmm. sort of speaking back to him. Mm -hmm. Is there a problem in sort of textually in attributing voices here? Because I know this is a big problem mm -hmm. in the epistles of Paul because he will, he uses this kind of antiphonal way of arguing where he says something and then someone says something back to him as a counter argument, but it's not marked in the text. Mm. And sometimes it's possible for Christian scholars and even Christian theologians to take something that Paul is citing as, as an objection that someone might make mm. to what he's saying as something that he's saying. Yeah. yeah. Does that happen in the Quran? Like, is, is, it, a, is it a problem in, in reconstructing the sequence of voices? So sometimes, usually it's not, and because usually there are these little markers, right? Okay. So basically it says when it's sort of, the way that the, that the Quran works is always the voice is not really Muhammad's voice per se, right? He's merely just delivering something. And so oftentimes it's an instruction, right? So it's God speaking through the prophet Muhammad through the angel that's delivering the message. So it works something like this. When these people say X, you should say Y in response. Oh, okay. And so, and so you always have this, this command like, Kul, which means to say, and so make sure you say this. Right, yeah. right. But okay. sometimes it, it takes the form of, of argumentation too. And it says like, they say this, but, uh, and then God responds himself in the first person, right? And it says, oh, if only they would ponder, if only they knew or something like that. It's kind of a rhetorical refrain. Okay. And, and one other thing I want to add to this picture, which is, so I, I don't know, this is at some point in the nineties, maybe I was a grad student, I don't remember, but I heard from a more sort of hypercritical approach to the Quran that and the state of the knowledge, you know, that we had in the 90s, that it wasn't possible to be sure of the existence of the text until, you know, Abd al-Malik put some verses of it on the Dome of the Rock. Mm. But yeah. I remember you telling me that that's now laid to rest, that we know it's a very early text. Can, can yeah. you say a little bit about how we know that? So we know this, I think, through multiple um, kind of regimes of evidence, right? So there's there's different ways in we can, that we can know about it. Um. So the first thing that I think has been extremely important that has happened in the last 20 years or so is that, well, this has really happened over much longer than the last 20 years, but I think uh, we started to see the fruits of this kind of slow growing tree kind of finally ripening and being able to be picked by scholars and, and appreciated. And one of these is, is a turn to the material history of the Quran itself. So we're finally looking at the oldest manuscripts of the Quran, the oldest copies, we're doing the paleographical analysis of the Arabic script. So seeing how the Arabic script evolved and changed over time and being able to create some sort of chronology to how the Arabic script changed. And we're also subjecting a lot of the earliest surviving copies on parchment or vellum mostly of the Quran to radiocarbon analysis. And a lot of the results have been to be perfectly honest, relatively shocking. It, it kind of happened when I was in midstream of graduate school. I mm -hmm. kind of had assumed that I was entering graduate school with the evidence looking one way. And then you started to see this kind of the stream of radiocarbon results, the kind of the um, new ways of viewing kind of Quranic codicology, new ways of viewing Arabic paleography. And it's like, wow, we actually have a text that is kind of very early. And I think there were earlier arguments that did not rely upon this material evidence that made a strong case for the Quran being kind of the early primeval document of kind of Muslim religiosity that, that were compelling. But I think these recent uh, discoveries and the headway that we've made in Arabic paleography and Arabic codicology, the codicology of the Quran in particular, has, uh, has, has really, I think, sealed the deal. Hmm. At least it's thrown the ball in the court of those who want to say otherwise. I mean, they're going to have to bring a mountain of evidence and be able to describe, uh, be able to take account of a mountain of evidence in order to make the counter case. And maybe someone can. I have some colleagues that think that they can. Uh, and, we'll, and I'm waiting to see what they have to say in, in future books and things like that. Uh, but nowadays, I think that it's, it's very clear that the Quran was codified uh, well before Abd al-Malik, and so this would be before 690. It would be well before 690. Um, and we don't just have, I guess one thing I could add as well that we have that's currently exploding right now 
is there's been a renewed interest in, um, in epigraphy. And so with the Islamic conquest, with kind of the spread of Islam, one of the things mm. that we get is an explosion in the epigraphic habit of early Muslims. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden people just start writing on rocks. They start writing their names on rocks. They start writing the names of their loved ones on rocks. They start writing prayers on rocks. And also what else they start writing on rocks? The Quran, right? And so we have these big citations of the Quran when we see them praying using the new idiom of the Quran that is kind of, we have pre-Islamic uh, Arabic inscriptions. They're not using the same idiom, right? You can definitely see the difference, right? And it's really extraordinary that you're like, wow, that it's everywhere. The Quran is all of a sudden pervading the language, right? Yeah. No, I was, <laughs> I was just remembering now that you were speaking about carving that on rock. That, so in Greek uh, epigraphy, Mm -hmm. So soon after the invention of the Greek alphabet, ah, mm -hmm. eight century BC or whatever, mm -hmm. what do the Greeks go doing? Well, they go carving on rocks who had sex with whom. <laughs> <laughs> it's far more chaste for the most part. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I just got this blast from a completely different culture. Of <laughs> largely homoerotic uh, stone inscriptions on Thera. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, so in recent years, many historians have been filling in the gap between the Quran as a primary source and the later um, Arabic Muslim sources with references to either the prophet or the Arab conquests or the new religion, you know, however they understood it, in non-Muslim sources and specifically in Greek and Syriac and Armenian sources and of the seventh century that are kind of contemporary with the conquests or very soon after the conquests. And I think that the value of this material has been appreciated uh, much more in recent times. And you certainly, you know, play it up in, in your book and, and try to extract from it, you know, everything that, uh, that we can. Now, this material is extremely fragment. Well, it doesn't come in fragments so much, but the, the references to the, the, the juicy bits that we want, they're, <laughs> they're snippets, right? They're tiny yeah. little snippets. Yeah. But they have the virtue of being A, contemporary, and B, independent of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and you survey these in, in your book. What picture emerges from them about the prophet and, and the early conquests and the whole movement? Yeah. So these are, I think these are really fascinating sources. I mean, they're, they're written in a wide variety of languages, um, relatively wide. I mean, mostly Armenian, Syriac, and Greek. And, you know, and it's not, these sources are not necessarily valuable in a way that I, so I guess what I want to say is I want to clear a, a potential misunderstanding that I often hear, not that you made it, uh, but that somehow historians view these sources as, as somehow being magical or able to kind of cut the Gordian knot of, mm. of the historiographical problem, right? These, these sources have their own problems too. I mean, they have their problems of perception. Are they accurate? Do they perceive things accurately? Mm. How good are the, is their information? How good are their informants? How much are they operating with the distorting lens through kind of the, their Christian polemic a lot of times? Of course, all these things are, are real problems. But one of the things that, why they fascinate me so much, I think why they continue to be of particular values, they, they do give us an idea of what it's like, one, to be conquered, right? And two, how they perceive the conquest, right? And how much someone being conquered or experiencing all these events was even aware of this thing called Islam or the Quran. Do they have any awareness of this stuff, right? And you get this impression that actually they had very little awareness at some, some sense. And, and some sense you have a sense that they also know more than they're letting on. Like if we could sit some of them down and interview them and drill them, I think maybe they would reveal more than their fragmentary writings kind of tell us, unfortunately. Um, but in general, what, what do they know? So they know, for example, that the conquest and the conquerors are inspired by the teaching of a man named Muhammad. We get Muhammad's name appears in these early sources within a decade after the traditional date of his death in 632, which mm -hmm. to me is just absolutely extraordinary as yeah. you compare it to the data for like Jesus and stuff like that. Um, and we also get an idea that uh, so Suda Sabia, since our mean history has some of the most interesting stuff, uh, he knows specific things about, the, he doesn't know about the existence of the Quran. At least he never lets on that he does. He doesn't say they have this book called the Quran or anything like that. But he does know about the tribe of Quraysh, Muhammad's tribe. This is going to be the new hegemon in the region. 
he does know uh, about some of the major commanders. He knows that there's a figure named Muhammad. He knows that he's a traitor. He was a traitor by, uh, by trade, which is a very big theme in the non-Muslim sources, but it's a very minor theme, barely present, I, I argue, in the Arabic sources. Um, he also knows, he also calls him a lawgiver. He never calls him a prophet. It's very rare for Syriac, Greek, or Armenian sources to call um, Muhammad a prophet, even a pseudo prophet. It's very much, much more common to call him a, uh, a lawgiver of sorts. So he comes and he brings law to his mm -hmm. people, is kind of the main idea. And he knows that, and they know that the laws are somehow related to, for example, the Torah, because they know that he, he doesn't eat pork and the his followers shouldn't eat pork. They know they don't drink wine and stuff like this. Um, and so usually the earliest sources they call uh, the prophet Muhammad, not a prophet, like I said, but rather a teacher, an instructor, someone who teaches monotheism, who, who is a lawgiver to his people, who is a leader of some sort, right? But in the, the very earliest sources don't have necessarily an idea that there's a scripture and things like that. Um, and they do have, I think, a strong sense of uh, it being a religion. And it's uneven when uh, you encounter this. But some of the early sources, one of the, one of the uh, sources that always sticks out to my mind is written by a monk and a priest who writes in Greek named Anastasius of Sinai. He gives this account of how the Muslim armies came into Sinai, the Sinai Peninsula. And he says that they're, he calls them Saracens, which is going to be the old Roman name for the inhabitants of the desert, the nomads. And in essence, he says, there are some Saracens that were Christians, and at first they resisted the coming of these folks from, from Arabia when they entered Sinai. But when they saw that they're going to be overwhelmed, they joined them. And, and basically, he writes something to the effect, and thus did they apostatize from the faith of mm -hmm. our Lord Jesus Christ, right? And so you have the idea that being a part of this uh, army had consequences beyond you know, sort of joining these rotting barbarian bands however uh, negatively the author wanted to cast them but it had kind of real consequences for someone's faith identity right yeah i think one of the earliest such references is in sophronius who's the patriarch of jerusalem and and i think mm -hmm. in a sermon that he gave in 634 i believe which is just a couple years later yeah. he refers to the godless saracens that are mm. causing trouble in the region and I that's it's just that that's all he says yeah. um but he says it, something also about the cr the cross being like cursed or something like that. something about like yeah. they're against the cross or something like which yeah, is yeah. obscure or whatever. but the fact that he would label them godless athe um yeah. while it's something that you could I guess you know someone involved in theological polemic as he was could use against anyone who was not of exactly the same Christian persuasion as he was yeah. But the fact that he would mention it indicates that he thinks that there's something especially religiously problematic about mm. these Saracens that are coming yeah. in, because they were used to Saracens coming in and out. Yeah. Uh, and uh, anyway, so I find the combination of those, those two terms fascinating. And you, you mentioned a, a couple of times in, in the book, and this is something that I've confirmed also, that the perception of the conquests by the conquered, at least at first, was that it was... In, in ethnic terms, that is, we're being conquered by the Saracens. The Saracens are these people you mentioned, like they've been part of the Roman and, and, and you know, Persian, Sasanian worldview for a long time. They were allies and auxiliary fighters and enemies and so forth. Like they're a particular people. We know who they are. They're like Goths or Huns or mm. whatever. Yeah. And they see the conquests in these ethnic terms. So what is the significance of that for you? Yeah. This is something I'm still unpacking, which, and I'm thinking about maybe making something like it is, is the object of maybe the next book or something like this, uh, because it's, it's a really big question. And I guess a quick way to, to pose the problem is, so the word Arab doesn't appear in the Quran ever. Arabic is like a term for language does, but the word Arab doesn't. And so one of the main questions that I think is it maybe a perennial question for, um, for early Islam within or thereafter is what is the relationship of the Arab of the Arabs right to Islam? How do they relate to it? Right? Are they a chosen people, or are they just one of the first people that uh, that the religion was revealed to? How universal is the religion? How particularistic is it? Et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, and one of the, what you don't have, so you don't have in the Quran any reference to to Arabs. You do have reference to 
an ummah in Arabic, which usually we translate as community, but an ummah, uh, well, I'll give you an example of how it works. So the Arabic translation, you know, the modern Arabic translation for the United Nations is al umum or the ummahs, the United Ummahs of the world, right? So um, an ummah can mean a nation, can have like this ethnic sense, but does an ummah mean a people that's united by faith or does it mean united by ethnic genealogy? And so this mm. stuff is really all up in the air. Um, and you definitely have a strong interest among the Arabian conquerors to say, you know, we have a special place because we have a special place in the empire, right? But the, the umma, an umma can be not just an ethnicity, it could also be something like a politeia, right? It could be a polity. It can be mm -hmm. a political community reunited by an ideology and stuff like that. Uh, but regardless, I think part of the, the key thing for the conquered when they're describing the conquerors is they have a polemical interest in portraying them as ethnic one because they want to particularize their beliefs right so they're not threatening to their communities but two it, the, this other theme that comes to the fore is associating them with hagar and ishmael right so they want to portray christians and christianity as coming through the abrahamic line of isaac and the son of the promise and they want to see them as being kind of a kind of a bastard offshoot of the Abrahamic legacy. And they are very conscious of the Abrahamic claims of the, of the early conquerors. And so they want to make them kind of the sons of the slave. To kind of, I think it's from Galatians where Paul has that, uh, that metaphor. So they kind of, well, they want to kind of mobilize that metaphor to, to a strong degree. Um, now, mm -hmm. what, what are the Muslims doing with all that ethnic language? This is a pretty live debate right now in terms of when did uh, the idea of being an Arab and Arabness coalesce for uh, kind of early Arabic speakers. That's why one of the ticks that you know, historians of early Islam tend to do is now we, we tend to speak of the Arabian conquerors and the Arabian tribes, and, but we refer to their geography coming from Arabia. But rarely nowadays do we say the Arab conquerors. I mean, some uh, will, and it's a big, it's, it's a big debate. So like my, my advisor was Fred Donner. So for him, it's the Islamic conquest. Right. But you take someone like Robert Hoyland, another very prominent historian, it's the Arab conquest. And that's something that we still have not come to a consensus of what to describe this conquest as. Are they the Arab conquest? Well, certainly to the conquered, they were the Arab conquest, right? So are they the Islamic conquest? Now, in the Muslim understanding, it was the Islamic conquest, right? These were conquests that were part of their sort of uh, their mission that they received from the prophet, right? And it's, it's part of kind of God's providential unfolding of history to spread Islam and to kind of bring the truth of the religion of the prophet Muhammad to as wide geography as possible, et cetera. Yeah, this is one of the key interpretive questions here, right there. And if not for the later legacy and connotations of the term, I might even be speaking of the Saracen conquest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, you know, how they're described in my texts, uh, yeah. at least. Uh, you know, actually, one of my favorite texts is this papyrus, one of the earliest ones, The and you, and you mentioned it in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, so it's got a, a one side in Arabic and one side in Greek. Um, I've read the, the Greek side. <laughs> um, and it is, so it's from, if I'm not mistaken, around what we call 642, yes. uh, right, AD? And it is a receipt <laughs> for 50 sheep, I believe, that a commander, an Arab commander in Egypt had, let's say, requisitioned from a local yeah. village. This village operating entirely in the Byzantine bureaucratic style, I guess said, okay, you can have the sheeps, but you must give us a receipt for it because that's how we <laughs> that's how we roll down here. And this uh, notary, Ioannis, right? He so he writes out the receipt that I so and so, you know, he transliterates the guy's name. And my uh, I don't know, it's got a hundred Saracens who are with me. Mm -hmm you know, took these 50 sheep and sheep. And then he, and then he signs it in Arabic. In other words, the guy gave him the receipt and said, now you sign here. Mm -hmm. And he effectively made the guy sign off on a document that's calling him a Saracen, mm -hmm. which I find hilarious. There's no <laughs> way he could read it. But the Arabic side doesn't contain anything like that. Mm -hmm. I think it has the other, oh, some other term. There's another, there's another Greek word on there. It's called, you would say, I don't know. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so this is a new word. Yeah. Right? This is a word that is unprecedented. 
And so this is this is something that I'm immensely interested in because the search, there is a search for what is the term that if they're not referring to the conquerors through an ethnic marker that they're using. Uh, and so the Syriac equivalent of that one, which I can't say better, is Mahagroye, right? So this comes from this Arabic word, Mahajarun, which we translate as immigrants, mm -hmm. right? And so um, this is a word that occurs in the Quran. It's one of the earliest self-designations of, of the Muslims. Uh, when the Prophet Muhammad does his famous Hijra in 622 from Mecca to Medina, the people that follow him are called Muhajirun. And the conquests are conducted by people who call themselves Muhajirun too. So you don't just do a, a Hijra or a immigration from Mecca to Medina. It's not a one time off event, but as a model event that serves as a template for expanding into the rest of the world. So there's a Hijra to, or immigration to Southern Iraq. There's a Hijra or immigration to uh, Palestine and Syria. There's a hijra to Egypt where we got these Mahajarun that are in uh, in Egypt that are there recorded. And so if, if we have any sense that these are a particular people that are defined by ideology, I would say these are called the hijra people, right? Mm -hmm. So, and one of the things that is a marker that we get from early papyri like this is not only do we have the indiction notice, not only do we have the local kind of calendar of the colony or, or whatever, but we also have a new calendar called the Hydra calendar, right? Which also is, is without precedent. And it begins in, to be used in the reign of the second tier of a god by the name of Omar ibn Khattab, the person who also oversaw the capitulation of Jerusalem to the, to the early Islamic armies. And so it's fascinating to me that what we get from the documentary record and from these non Muslim sources as well is the importance of this idea of Hijra and the importance of this identity marker of being among the Hijra people, right? The immigrants. It's, I think it's one of the a very underappreciated uh, piece of evidence uh, in, in my field. And I think it's one of the reasons why I think it's particularly important is um, it's, it gives us a date from, for the life of the prophet Muhammad, right? So you, would, you wouldn't have the Hijra people without the Hijra, right? Yeah. And so you can just count backwards for when the Hijra calendar begins. It begins in 622, the year that uh, the prophet Muhammad goes from Mecca to Medina. And then it doesn't immediately begin uh, being used there, but when they start instituting this new calendar and all kind of the administrative and religious identity stuff that comes with instituting a new calendar. So it's a pretty massive undertaking. Uh, we have this date and we have this date that is, is pretty easily established. I mean, because in the proper record it tends to record for us, not just one calendrical system, but multiple ways of reckoning time, you can kind of use double dating and triple dating to get a very good idea of, of when they're talking about it, it almost always takes us back to 622. Yeah, when I encountered this uh, evidence a couple of years ago, I did an in-depth study of the scholarship on, on early Islam as such as I could find. Um, it, it blew me away hmm. that all of that apparatus was already in place at such an early time because hmm. it, you know, it means so much, right? That it, it's almost like finding a single specimen of life on Mars. Mm -hmm. But that just immediately implies a whole <laughs> ecosystem, right? It's not yeah, like a single exactly. thing. Yeah. And it's one of those, you know, very small individual things like the um, rock inscriptions that you mentioned that imply this sort of massive background of engagement and reorientation in time mm -hmm. and space and your labels and identity and everything that's taken place. Uh, and And, you know, that's why I find it so... Um, it's sort of exhilarating. It's these small things that that reveal huge things. Um, and yeah, again, the wonders of papyri. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 your Byzantine notaries. Yeah. Um, now, okay, all of this stuff takes place in the early chapters of your book, and much of the book contains uh, a pretty you know in depth philological and historical study of a particular tradition, the Sira Makazi tradition um, of you know, writing about Muhammad in the Quran. And I didn't want to get into all the technical details here. I mean, it's the podcast mm. form is not sort of that conducive for all of that. But can you tell us um, sort of briefly about what this tradition is and what's at stake in it? And, and you know, what do you do with that tradition in your book? Mm. Basically, this tradition called Sira Mahazi is, it's the, 
I, I would say it's kind of ground zero for the birth of historiography and Arabic language. Uh, maybe not everybody would follow me that far, but I think the earliest people that wrote down history, they did it in this genre. But more or less in its, its simplest form, it's telling the story of the life of the prophet Muhammad. But in reality, if you actually read the text, uh, it tells the story of God's providential ordering of history. So a lot of times the Sirah Mahazi literature has the life of the prophet Muhammad as its centerpiece. It's kind of like the climax of, of human history, but it really has uh, two other parts that are worth paying attention to as well. The first part of that would be kind of the Genesis version. So it takes you from Adam and the creation mm. of the universe all the way, and everything that happened until then. Okay. And so usually that will mean um, it's, it's not by any means, it's not a particle history is another way of saying it. So you have the history of the creation of the earth, and then you have the history of say the Romans and the Persians and the biblical prophets and the biblical patriarchs, etc. And then you have a local history of what was going on in Arabia and then the life of the prophet Muhammad. There's very much quintessentially late antique text, if, if you want to use that term, because it's, it's a, it inhabits a world of, of priests and monks and rabbis and emperors and, and Persian kings, etc. And then it zooms into the life of the prophet Muhammad and his kind of humble, uh, you know, patch of, of Arabia. And then after he passes away and he's successfully kind of delivered the Quran as God charged him, and he has united the tribes of, of Arabia under the banner of Islam, it kind of expands again to be this epic story of the spread of the early Islamic polity and in the early Islamic conquest, right? And so the main kind of audience for this would be who you might wonder well for the most part it seems that uh a literature of this kind of epic scale seems to have been written uh for for the caliphs and for their court and for the instruction of their children and their family members but at the same time it's not something that they created which is interesting so it's not like they randomly picked up a guy and said, hey, go through our archives and figure all this out or something like this. They seem to have actually harnessed a already existing tradition where people would preach and tell stories in mosques, that people would gather in kind of uh, informal scholarly networks uh, at people's homes and transmit materials and things like that. And they would be, I mean, these are informal, but still these are individuals that are kind of revered within their locality. And some of these are cultural epicenters. So when I say revered, I mean like, oh, he's the guy that has grandma's memories, but he's actually a person that you go to to, to mm. arbitrate actually some more sophisticated disputes. Um, but in any case, these are kind of people that uh, oftentimes live in, in Medina, post-conquest Medina after the prophet Muhammad lived. And, and say the caliph would be going on Hajj. He goes, the caliph lives in Syria, it's the usual scenario. So he leaves, say he leaves Damascus, he takes a long journey. He's gonna go to the Hajj in Mecca, but first he comes to Medina, right, to the north. He stops, he says, show me around to the guys that know what they're talking about. I wanna see where the prophet Muhammad did this. I wanna see where, uh, that happened. I want to know where this battle happened. And so they asked the main guy who's in authority and he shows him around and things like that. And so sometimes the ruler would say, why don't you write that down for me? And then it says, oh, I already have <laughs> you know, something <laughs> like this. Uh, so in any case, uh, these stories, these stories tend to be a part of this idea of communal identity formation, right? This is part of I guess the communal memory, right? Uh, and so they're basically telling the story, who are we, where do we come from? How do we fit into God's plan? And why did he pick us of all people to be kind of the vanguard for uh, his plan for all humanity, right? And so this is the genre in which that story is told. So is it a correct reading of your methodology in, in the book to, so once you've studied that tradition and and there's some complex arguments there about the different redactions and the lines of transmission and who commissioned what and so forth. But when all that is said and done, you then put it next to the non-Muslim sources and you try to find areas of potential overlap mm. and suggest that those are, so that's like the common, you know, earliest tradition in a certain mm. sense that those are, 
the more um, likely avenues uh, where we might want to press for finding the historical Muhammad, right? Like where mm -hmm. they agree in the earliest versions. Yeah, I mean, part of, part of my kind of assumption is when you look at the non-Muslim sources and they tell us something about the life of, of Muhammad or, or his teachings are and things like that, that uh, they're not kind of pulling these out of thin air a lot of times. A lot of times they actually have a Muslim source, a Muslim informant, whether it be one or two or three steps removed, there's usually some sort of informant behind mm -hmm. that. And so these non-Muslim sources can sort of give us an insight into the earliest version of these sources. So what, one thing that's really fascinating is, is how this once these stories get written down, how they go from being pious stories and to becoming ratified as fact, right? We can't imagine anything else. I'll give you a short example uh, that I like to use, even though I didn't use it in my book because it it's one of the, the B-side tracks that'll be coming out later as an, as an article, but uh, it's, it's the story. You just dated yourself. <laughs> I know, exactly. Um, so it's basically about when the Prophet Muhammad was born, okay? Usually the Prophet Muhammad is said to be born in the year 570. There's all sorts of reasons why that, that uh, date is used. And the usual story that you get in most surveys and most kind of introductory books is the year 570 is a, is a really important year because the ruler of Yemen tried to destroy Muhammad's hometown. Mecca by marching an elephant against it, but God protected the city by a miracle. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. So that story is considered to be 100% true, fact, etc., from about the mid 8th century onwards. But every version of the Prophet Muhammad's, every version of the story, so that of the story of the elephant that comes before that, however, puts it way before the birth of the Prophet Muhammad. It puts it before, some versions put it before the birth of the Prophet Muhammad's father. Mm. Some versions put it during the uh, the teenagerhood or adolescence would be the better word of his grandfather, right? So how did that happen? How did that story kind of get slowly updated and things like that? So you have, a, you have these different regimes of history that eventually convey fact. Um, and something that happens later too is a different genre is you have the astrological histories that enter the fray too. So sometimes they'll have, uh, you know, different historical accounts like, well, which date is right? And like, well, let's do the horoscope. And that's how we'll determine that. And that's considered to be a more scientific way of, of choosing who's right or wrong. Uh, but the key thing is when you put these sources in dialogue with one another, you find two things. One, you find this as uh, ways in which certain aspects of, of the Prophet Muhammad's life is is either played up or played down by different traditions. So first example of that, non-Muslim tradition tends to play up the fact that Muhammad was a traitor, because if he's a traitor and he's traveling around, then he can meet monks, he can meet rabbis, he can kind of learn all these horrible ideas, right? That he, that mm -hmm. either from heretics or something that creates this new religion, right? Now, when you look to the Muslim tradition, you have this idea that Muhammad's tribe, Quraysh, are traitors and that Muhammad may have marginally participated in some trade journeys, but he's not like well-traveled by any means. And he certainly doesn't have teachers that are rabbis or teachers that are monks and, and things like that. He's relatively a cultural virgin, right? The Quran is a miracle. He doesn't know the stories of Jesus because he heard them from a priest. He knows the stories of Jesus because he heard them from an angel, right? Right. And so you have these different uh, emphases and, and things like that that are really interesting to, to look at. So one of the people I wanted to talk about, but we're almost out of time. I don't think we can fit him in is Ibn Ishaq. Um, mm -hmm. And who comes a, a, across in your book is a really fascinating character. And mm -hmm. he has a far more of a personality than I thought <laughs> <laughs> uh, from the references I had to him before. Yeah. Uh, so let's skip past him because I want to get to some of the late antique material that you mentioned earlier. Because one of the arguments that you make in the book is that these Muslim traditions um, about the prophet are sort of enmeshed in the conventions of late antique literature, and in particular hagiography. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a particular story type or trope that you mentioned, the um, Ikra um, type of narrative. Can you tell us what this is? And why would Byzantine hagiography and even Romanos Melodos come up in your, I was kind of shocked when you went there. I was like, whoa, yeah. Yeah. but it was great. It, you, you actually make it work. So what's all that about? <laughs> 
So, oh, my dog is barking. Can you hear the dog? Okay, okay. So, did you hear her? Is it loud in the background? Or? Um, he okay, okay. Yeah, okay, good. On. Okay, so the, the hedgeography part is, is interesting to me because it gets to kind of expectations of genre and what the Sira Malhazi literature is competing with. So, hedgeography is one of those genres. Uh, kind of epic history is one of those genres as well, especially when we look in the Persian version, like the stories of kings and, and the origins of the Iranian nation and things like that. Um, and then also another interesting genre that a lot of people don't think about for the early Islamic context or um, like the Alexander romance, letters of uh, between Alexander and Philip and, and Aristotle are also very important too. Um, but really, I think the hagiography is important because it, it lays down these expectations for the audience of this genre about the epic life of the prophet Muhammad of what's a holy person look like? Right? What's a prophet look like? What are what are the sorts of experiences that one expects them to have? And it really my interest in this started just with the puzzle. Um, it's a similar kind of experience that I think a lot of people find when they're reading this, this chapter on the Iqra narrative. The Iqra narrative is basically this. The prophet Muhammad is uh, generally a pious person, but he's a normal individual. He withdraws from his uh, city to go to the mountain to just ponder well he, he does charity and he and he prays and stuff but he's not a prophet he's just a regular pious person and all of a sudden he has this vision he falls asleep and he has this vision of a, of an angel it's an angelic preacher that commands him to read he says uh i can't read and the angel says read and he says what shall i read and then the angel says read in the name of your lord he says one two three kind of thing and then he wakes up and he has this miraculous ability to recall this revealed text, which is the first sort of our first chapter of the Quran in Fiyanta. Um, It's a really famous story. Uh, and I remember I was reading uh, the ecclesiastical history of the venerable Bede, as one does. <laughs> <laughs> and you have the story of the first Anglo-Saxon uh, poet, or at least the first poet in the Anglo-Saxon vernacular, named um, uh, Kedmon. And it tells the exact same story. That is Kedmon, he falls asleep, he has an angelic visitor. Instead of telling him to read, he says, sing. He says, I can't sing, I'm gonna sing, blah, blah, blah. And then he wakes up, he has this miraculous ability to sing. And I'm like, holy cow. So how in the world, did, so Beat is riding on the marshes of North Umbria in the early eighth century, so super far away from uh, the Islamic conquest. I don't even, who knows if he even knew who the prophet Muhammad was as a person. And he knew about the Saracen conquest and he asked for like pepper from the East and stuff like that. But his knowledge of what's going on in, in the early Islamic poly, polity is, is highly questionable. Who knows what he knows? Um, like how in the world do we have these correspondences, mm -hmm. right? That are so close to one another between the two stories. And so this led me to start to read more hagiography. And one thing I started to note is particularly late into hagiography, whether we're talking about uh, hagiography in, in Coptic or in Greek or in Syriac is there's a lot of these interesting tropes that in kind of narrative devices and narrative set pieces that tend to jump across these linguistic barriers. Uh, and you know, when you start reading this, you notice this even outside the life of the prophet Muhammad. I think one of the first ones that I noticed about this was actually about a descendant of the prophet Muhammad named Zayd ibn Ali. He's crucified by a tyrannical ruler. And uh, when, he, when the tyrannical ruler crucifies him, uh, the next day, miraculously, he turns to face Qibla, turns to face Mecca. Uh, you have the exact same story told about an Armenian martyr at the hands of the of the Umayyads is told in this Armenian uh, martyrology. Instead of, instead of the cross change, uh, switching to face Mecca, it switches to face the east, right? Um, so if you look at the hagiography, you get what I would call maybe these stories of like the cultural virginity of some person, a cultural virgin, virgin and he has this uh, miraculous event and it gives him this, this divine charisma or this divine gift that allows him to kind of be of service to God's works in the world. So for Romanos, uh, it's the gift to to compose the Kontakion, right? So these these kind of beautiful Greek hymns. For Kedmon, again, it's these, these hymns in the vernacular of the Anglo-Saxons. And for the Prophet Muhammad, it's 
to compose this beautiful, uh, the Quran is considered to be miraculously beautiful, it should be noted, uh, these kind of beautiful surahs in his own vernacular uh, of Arabic, except these are not just mere hymns, this is now going to be a new scripture in the Muslim view and the final scripture that God reveals to humanity. Yeah, um, it was for me, so, so your argument, one of the uh, strongest, um, to proof texts for the convergence of late antique and early Islamic studies, like how much, you know, they can learn from each other and mm. that, yeah, I mean, they, they do not just overlap, but kind of stem from the same world mm. uh, in a way. And, and, and this is one of the most striking uh, points of convergence that I've seen. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if you're sitting around reading bead, um, I, I would encourage all sort of Western <laughs> medievalists and Byzantinists who are listening to, you know, uh, go ahead and, and read any uh, early Arabic text. You've translated some. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you never know what you're going to find. And that's the great thing about it, you know, because if you're just reading all the same stuff that, you know, everybody's worked over in your field and you've read it or about it so many times. Anyway. Um, yeah, no, it was great to see Byzantine hagiography show up there, and and you even cite my friend Stefanos, uh, <laughs> who's yeah the go-to person for that. Yeah. Um, so last question, uh, it, I want to ask you about social memory because you mm. push against it a little bit in your introduction, mm -hmm. and you know I was I was kind of cheering you on there. I, I <laughs> yeah, I, I I've been down that sort of um, cul-de-sac of of social memory uh, a few times and I, I, I'm you know trying to break out of it as much uh, as you are here so so what is this field of research uh, social memory what does it do and what it, what are its limitations so I would say that social memory communal memory this sort of thing it's really about how communities construct their identities through stories they tell about the past and how the past is meaningful for them and and for who they are and things like that um, it's, you know, one of the things that's amazing about, I think, historians that work in, histor in, in communal memory, social memory, and things like that, is how they're, they're able to show what kind of, uh, what is supposed to be immutable, right? Some vision of the past that embodies the nation, or some vision of the past that embodies this kind of group, I don't know, whether it be a religion or whatever. How the, the idea is that the story is immutable, but historians of social memory can show how it changes really quite a bit. And how it changes in view in view of new ideologies and new kind of historical circumstances and things like that, and it's very compelling. And uh, when done well, <laughs> when it's not done so well, though, I think that it tends to wallpaper over a lot of very interesting historiographical problems, and also it can be used as a way to avoid interesting philological questions and questions about historical agency. Right, so. One of, one of the abuses that I see that I kind of get annoyed about is particularly when you look at the, this big corpus of, um, of the Sira Mahazi literature and things that are similar to it, is just say, oh, that's all communal memory. Well, if something as big as that, that is really the preserve of erudite specialists and scholars is communal memory, then who's really doing the memory here? Who's, who's really doing the memory recall and stuff mm. like that? Um, I think something more is going on than just saying, oh, this is all communal memory. And also it's, it's a way to, to avoid the question of how old is this and is this authentic and is it historical? Um, I, I'm not like a died in the wool positivist by any means. Like, I don't think no. that uh, we can know history as it was or anything like that. But I think still those questions are important so that what we know as historians, one, uh, that we're not uh, falling prey to historical error. And two, that we have sort of a, a hold on uh, our own kind of epistemological humility, what we can know and what we can't know. I think this is very important, especially when you think about how authority is constructed socially, and a lot of times it relies upon memory. And I think part of the contributions that historians have uh, is that we can use evidence in order to be a countervailing force to some of the insidious effects of, of communal memory, uh, you know, because it's not always for the positive, right? And that we don't have to, have to limit ourselves to mere kind of affirmative historiography of, oh, how great your story is, how wonderful your story is, because th those stories can, can often be used for, uh, you know, not always stellar ends. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean we're seeing this play out in, well, I think, 
the the contest over social memory is always playing out at any time that we're living in any society. I mean, we can see it today in the United States over you know the uh, struggles over the Confederacy and you know yeah. where do we remember it right yeah. or quote or commemorate it and should yeah. we right that, that sort of thing. Um, in the periods in which we work. And I think it's also necessary to st stress that. And I think work in social memory does a great job in reminding us that often these traditions are sort of constructed and they evolve and, and so forth. But there's also room, I think there needs to be more room for the sort of in-depth philological and historical work that you, you do in this book, uh, that we can do more than just kind of passively say, well, this is what people were saying at this point. Yeah, yeah. And also sometimes I feel that individual texts and authors are picked by modern scholars as the voices of a particular social memory mm. and treated yeah. as representatives of their culture and society. And, you know, I sometimes feel, no, that's just one guy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's very particular. And how, how do we know that this is social rather than just one person's agenda? Yeah. Um, and you do that also in the book. I mean, you, you actually track down these traditions as much as we can, you know, who wrote them when and why. And they turn out to be, you know, involved in, dare I say it, <laughs> politics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Political. Yeah. Who would have thought? Yeah. Anyway. One, of the, one of the examples I always like to give is, is Jan Osman, right? He you just think you see it between Akhenaten, who is a figure of history, right? Mm -hmm. He's, uh, but not a figure of memory, and Moses, who's a figure of memory but not a figure of history. We have absolutely no historical evidence for for Moses you know, inside the Hebrew Bible. However, you want to evaluate that, um, but his his memory is massively important, right? Uh, Akhenaten, we have a lot of historical evidence for him. Uh, but no one remembered him. No, you know, he doesn't appear in any historical memory, right? And so when one of the things that is fascinates me and, and it, I think pulls me into the figure of the Prophet Muhammad is that uh, is you have to write, uh, kind of walk this tightrope because he's actually a memory, he's a figure of historical memory and he's a, his, he's a figure of history too. And so I kind of just want to, want to bring a little bit more balance to that historical craft aspect of who Muhammad was not to negate the historical memory aspect of him, but just to add a little bit of, of balance. And you do, you do. Yeah. Um, Sean, this is a wonderful book, um, and I had fun talking uh, with you about it today. Yeah, me too. And uh, I strongly recommend it to anyone who wants to jump into, you know, what's going on, sort of cutting edge of early Islamic studies, uh, Muhammad and the Empires of Faith, the Making of the Prophet of Islam. I strongly recommend it. So thanks for being on the podcast. My pleasure.